Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Open Invest is an innovative Melbourne-based investment platform, giving Australians access to investment portfolios managed by the world's leading investment managers, including BlackRock, JP Morgan, and Schroders. It's ideal for clients and prospects you can't support via traditional financial advice-led portfolio management. Or, if you have your own well-resourced and experienced portfolio management team, Open Invest can customise their tech to give your firm its own digital investing solution. Your brand, your portfolios, your content, accessible directly from your website via general advice. Today's conversation is with Catherine Belford from Focused Wealth. She recently completed a money coaching course, so I wanted to learn what is that? How do you integrate it into your financial advice conversations and how can it enrich client relationships? I also need to do a very large disclaimer. Learning of the week, if you are going to record a podcast, make sure you record it with the right microphone. Mm, Everyone, an apology. I didn't use the right mic, but the conversation was so good, we needed to keep it. And to be honest, it's not about me. It's about Catherine. So an apology, a learning. I will be better next week. Please enjoy. Hello and welcome, Catherine. Hi, Jess. I am very excited for today's conversation. I messaged you after I saw a social media post that you had done a money coaching course and I was like, I must learn more. This has been on my hit list for a very long time. And so today I would absolutely love us to get an insight in terms of what you did and what the outcome of all of that was and sort of what you're practically finding that's meaning in terms of outcomes for the business, but also the clients or members that you have. But I think we need to go back in time before we, before I give you a barrage of questions on, on the money coaching course you did. I think for people that don't know you, it would be lovely for you to tell us a bit more about your background and your story. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Jess. So it's a bit of a story. I'll try and cut it a bit short. But basically, I started in the financial services industry about 14 years ago now. Um, it was really, I was buying my first investment property and my mortgage broker said to me, why don't you look at financial planning? And I'm like, I had no idea what a financial planner did. I'd never heard about financial planning, so I had no idea what to expect. And I was sort of in, my dad had just died at 53. So mm-hmm. that was a real like, I guess, moment in time of, okay, where do I take my life? Mm-hmm. And yeah, then it was like, okay, let's find out about financial planning and got a job and became an insurance specialist. And so I did that for over 12 months and then I wanted to, I guess, look at the other side. So I became a BDM and Mm -hmm. got a job as a BDM, hence where we met Jess (laughs) in the BDM days. And I became a BDM and did that for the next 10 years. And, you know, just seeing the industry, seeing the changes that were occurring, and just wanting to do something different uh, and going back to the advice side, especially when you when I saw so many advisors leaving the industry as, as well and also being a female, you know, it, there's not many females out there. So for me, I just, yeah, I wanted to get out there back into the advice game and so then I looked at, well, do I join another practice? Do I start my own business? And this was right at the professional standards moment in time. So then I thought, no, I'm going to, you know, start my own business and take that roller coaster journey. And yeah, and here I am. And basically through that, as you know, it, it is a roller coaster when you start a, a business. I don't, I don't think it matters what business it is. But I'd seen an, another lady who was an ex financial planner, actually. And mm-hmm. she was a money coach on LinkedIn and she'd, put these amazing posts up and I was like, oh, my God, like I loved everything she wrote about, Karen Ely is her name. And so I got in touch with her and I said, what do you do? Like what is a money coach? And so she got me into um, having a chat with Deborah Price, who's the founder of the Money Coaching Institute in California, 
And then I just went from there and started the money coaching course as um, a beginner. I just felt that was so much to be gained by understanding a client on a deeper level. Mm. So money coaching is very much the internal workings of a person, whereas financial planning is very much the external operations of, you know, setting up a super, setting up, a, you know, insurances and so forth. Interesting. I've got so I've got so many questions for you. Um, before we get on that, yeah, you and I are similarly crazy in that I actually didn't know you were an insurance specialist first, but you jumped out of BDM land and started a financial planning business. Before we move into the coaching stuff, for for people who live in a more for, for, for the BDMs listening to the XY Advisor podcast, for anyone that works in a big practice and has never run their own financial planning business. Let's talk. Tell me, how was that for you? What were the biggest surprises in either a good, bad or ugly way? Um, definitely, I probably was a little bit naive. And I kind of think you have to be. Oh my <laughs> God. In the you have to be. Otherwise, you have to be completely insane. <laughs> exactly. I was just like, oh, yeah, this will be right start a business I'll you know thinking oh yeah I've got these accountants and people I know that I'll get referrals and I'm like no it doesn't quite work like that and it's quite funny having been a BDM for 10 years going into advisors businesses talking to them about their businesses how they grow their business where they get their clients from and then the reality of actually going out there and doing it I'm like hats off to all the planners out there <laughs> totally 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 I think um there's a beautiful naivety that you need to go into starting your own financial planning business, having, having not been a financial planner either for a very, very long time or, or in my case, not at all. So I'm hearing that it was, that it's a lot more sort of complicated than you had imagined. Can you sort of, can you elaborate at all? What's been sort of the, what have been the great bits and what have been the most difficult bits for yeah. you? Look, I think the greatest thing is being able to create something that's yours. And that was my biggest thing initially when I was umming and ahhing about do I join a practice, do I start my own business? And I'm like, I wanted to create something, you know, from having my years of knowledge and research and I'm like, okay, how can I do this? How can I do this differently? How can I be unique as well in the industry? So that was a big thing for me too. I didn't want to... um I didn't want to just do the norm is probably the best way to put it. And I really wanted to target a demographic that a lot of planners didn't really deal with and that was the younger 30 to 50-year-old space, yeah. basically 10 years either side of me sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so that's yeah, that's how I really got into it and just thought I really want to focus on those people. And what's been the hardest bits? What's been the bits that you're like, oh, this is shit? <laughs> Uh, I think early days it was like when you didn't have a client or you were like twiddling your thumbs and you're like, okay, what do I do next? And, you know, I think I have to say having had the BDM experience, I then started networking, getting out there. I joined networking groups such as Fresh. I looked at BNI. I didn't join BNI though. Mm. Uh, and I was like, you know, you have to put yourself out there. And that was a big thing. Like as a BDM, you're kind of used to that because we'd go into a room at a conference or a PD day. So it's like, okay, go up and talk to an advisor. So it was good in that sense. But, yeah, just putting yourself out there is a, you know, was real. what really helped me. Mm, I focused too much on the business development when I started the business. I didn't focus on back office stuff. I had no idea how to write an SOA. So... It's interesting having the two of us come from similar backgrounds. I feel like we could have wine and talk about all of the things that we've done yeah, we for hours. <laughs> but alas, that is not why we're here. Um, so what does the business look like now? And are you still staying true to that 30 to 50-year-old demographic? And if so, why did that lend itself to this concept of money coaching? Um, yeah, definitely. Like I think I've got two clients outside of that demographic and the rest are in that, you know, 30 to 50-year-old. Some are even younger, which is wow. great. Like I love to deal with even people in their 20s because mm -hmm. it's not about how much money you have. So it's about what you actually do with it. 
And that was a big thing for me, um, you know, being a 40-year-old now, I can't even, I can't believe I'm 40, but, you know, <laughs> just turning. 40 is a new 30, just so you know. Yeah, I know, exactly. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just jumping in there and I just thought, you know, you sit down with a client, you go through what their goals and objectives are, what do you want your future to look like, but then you can put this amazing plan together but then at the end, what if they don't stick to it? And often with the younger generation, you know, when you look at what we do with our money, it's like, well, I want to go out or I want to do this. So I want to have this experience. Experiences are such a big thing for younger people as well. Yeah. And growing families, we're having a baby, we're buying our first home. And so, you know, it was like, well, why can't people save? Why? What's holding people back from actually making changes and it's all behavioural. Totally. And I think as advisors we like to believe that it's definitely not, that it's beautiful and it's clean and it's numbers on a spreadsheet, but it's not. It's that, you know, mum and dad's farm got taken over when we were younger or my parents um, didn't have anything so now I am really worried about losing something all the time and you know there's just all of this emotional baggage that comes with money that I think us as a profession don't really know how to deal with because for me I'm like good lord I'm like a fake therapist because I feel like I'm unpacking information about people's childhood and belief systems that I don't really have the working knowledge about (laughs) how to fix that I mean is that true for you why you started looking into money coaching. I know you said that you saw the LinkedIn post. Tell me more about what sparks the interest in you. Um, it was actually one of my first clients that came on board with me, a young couple um, in their late 30s, a couple of um, twin boys. And it, it, funnily enough, when they came to me, they didn't talk about money. So money was a very taboo subject in their mm-hmm. household. Um, he really ran the money and she just, you know, looked after the kids and just spent and, you know, there was no agreement, there was no clear agreements around their money, there was no, um, you know, no thoughts around, well, what's our future hold? It was just living day to day. And when it was interesting when we first got together and started chatting and they said when they first got married or, you know, you go and see the celebrant or the priest and they ask you about all these questions around, um, you know, your, your background and your future and what you hope for in your marriage and that type of stuff. And she said one of the things that they brought up with them was you probably have a lot of conflict around money. And they did. And money is such a um, big conflict in relationships, hence why so many people get divorced. Isn't that the number one? It's like the number one. Re- it's the number one reason. And we as the professionals don't necessarily have all the tools and equipment to support those conversations. That's crazy. Can we just stop on that? Okay. Absolutely crazy. Oh, definitely. It is. It is. But, you know, you can see why. People don't have the tools. They don't know how to have a conversation around money. Mm. They have never, you know, they often will go day to day in their life. And now we see people getting into relationships when they're older. So, you know, people aren't getting together in their early 20s, getting married. You know, they've already created a life for themselves. They've already got predated patterns and behaviours that they've been living for a long yeah. time. Yeah. So when you go into a relationship when you're older, it's very hard to then join money, join forces together and then actually learning to actually understand what's really important to each other as well, which is really key. So you had this couple, money was clearly a friction point and conflictful and a taboo by the sounds of it. How did that lend itself to thinking, I'm going to go and do a money coaching course? Yeah, well, as I said, I'd seen Karen's posts on LinkedIn and I was like, oh, I love what she's talking about. And then when I reached out to her and had a chat, I'm like, okay, I need to do this course. Because as you said, you do feel like a therapist sometimes and I'm like I'm having these conversations and I really, you know, yes, you try and help as best you can, but I didn't really have the tools. I just had my own knowledge, my own personal experience. And the money coaching course gives you the tools to be able to have the, you know, difficult conversations. It's actually a diagnostically driven process that you go through with a client, so a four-step core process. And that really helps you to 
uncover, identify, and find out well, what are those patterns and behaviours which have been formed basically from the ages of two to 12 years old. Mm. So when you start digging in, you're like, wow, okay, this makes sense. Fascinating. So just contrastingly, we went down a different route. Why? I don't know. But we, uh, we being Glenn and I, um, in our business, we quite quickly realized, you know, we were having people cry. We were having people having quite conflictful relationship conversations in front of us. And we were like, oh, well, they're doing it. Let's talk about income protection and, and super. Um, we did what's called an ACT therapy. I think it was like a two day or three day full day course, which is acceptance and change therapy. So basically accepting behaviors, um, understanding, you know, what are the changes that someone wants to make and helping them make commitments to change their behavior. It's really for therapists. So we were really like, I think we were the only financial planners ever there. The guy was really confused about why financial advisors would rock up to this. Um, it was definitely very in depth, probably too in depth for us. We were like, this is very full on. Um, we probably should have, in retrospect, done a money coaching course. So we're going to, we're going to get a bit more into that, knowing that you are someone who's done the course. You're not the person who runs the course or owns the course and has all of the stuff on it, which is probably what it's called out. But, um, at a very simple level, what is the money coaching course? What is the course that you went through as an advisor? Yep. So it went for about 10 weeks. So it was a two hour session every week. So I just basically blocked it in my diary for the next 10 weeks. And then you were on a Zoom recording. So it's all Zoom learning and it's interactive. So you're in a Zoom room with a number of other people. It's worldwide. So you had people, most of the people in my group were from like America, um, yeah, probably America and Australia, most people. And so we went through the um, certified money coaching um, information, documents, tools, and actually learnt the process. But through that process, we actually had practice clients. So I actually had two practice clients um, that I, you know, went out and sourced and I said, would you mind being my practice client for this? And one of those clients has now been a long-standing client of mine from a financial planning aspect as well as from a coaching aspect and we're actually now doing business coaching and couples coaching with her as well so there are other <laughs> courses but <laughs> but the money coaching course was basically that four-step core process starter to go through the 10 weeks and it gives you the tools to be able to have that you know basically set up a system where you can set up meetings with a client so what I do is if someone says to me I want to do the money coaching I'm like okay it's generally four sessions they generally go for about 90 minutes and then we book them in and we go through the four step core process through each of those meetings and that helps us to really uncover and identify those patterns and behaviors and then what are the small but significant things we can do to start shifting those patterns and behaviors that that person has. Fascinating. So just to clarify, so you did a 10-week course, uh, which was interactive. You were part of a group that was worldwide, which is amazing because we don't often get that crossover because obviously we have different tax laws and different super laws. And so I guess just hearing other people is so interesting. And of course, this has no jurisdiction. Money behaviors and patterns is all of us. Um, so you did the 10-week course. You then have built what sounds like a money coaching program that you have monetized that you offer off the back of that course uh, uh yeah completion of that course which is four sessions 90 minutes each and someone commits to doing that for the entirety of the process and presumably pays for all of those four sessions yeah up yep. front. is that how that yep. works yeah yep so generally pay up front and does that naturally then come before they are financial planning. Like talk, talk to me about the difference now in your business for money coaching v what we would consider normal traditional financial plan. Yeah. So ideally I want clients that come on board to do the money coaching first. Yep. Especially like I get a lot of single women that come to me as well. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure you do too. Because it's a market that hasn't <laughs> been growing for a very long and hopefully more people like us will join and that market will continue to grow so yes lots of love to the ladies that come to you yeah definitely and even men like I've done um coaching with some 
men, which has been really interesting as well because men uh, tend to hold on to their emotions, tend mm-hmm. not to show it. It mm-hmm. is a very emotional process. Like often people can be in tears from what comes up through um, the journey, which may scare some people, but yeah. it's actually so powerful uh, when you think about the relationship you form with a client because you have that deeper understanding of them and their background. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely um, it's well worth doing the course like I you know I look at where my business was where it is now the processes that I'm putting in place um, the relationships that I'm actually holding with clients now are on such a deep level that uh, you know you talk about ongoing clients these are the clients you want they're the ones you want it that come back to you that want you for support not just from a you know external planning perspective but everything that goes on in their life Totally, totally, totally. And from what I'm hearing, some of the people that are coming to you for money coaching may never have thought that they would do financial planning, but as part of the process, learning more about themselves and their trip ups, then become financial planning clients. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, so most of my clients are coming through the financial planning channel. Funnily enough, so um, I'm really starting to work because the money coaching is more of a newer part of my business. Um, I'm starting to like I'm building a new website for it um, specifically for money coaching. I'm doing a lot more, um, I guess, marketing around it as well to really get that side of the business out there. Because yeah. everybody knows about financial planning, really, in a sense. Like they know, okay, you go to a financial planner um, and they'll help you sort out all your financial bits and bobs for your life. Um, whereas the money coaching is really unheard of and people don't really have a great understanding of what money coaching is all about. They often think it's about budgeting and it's like, no, nowhere near budgeting. <laughs> What would you say to the advisor that's listening to this going, oh, that sounds like, you know, wishy-washy, I do a great job of investments and all the rest of it, I don't need to do that. What would your counter-argument be to them in that thought process? Personally, I love it because I like to know people on a deeper level at the end of the day. So, Mm -hmm. you know, some planners don't want to have that core relationship it's more like I'm here to manage your finances and make sure you get from A to B Mm. and that's fine for the people that want to do that but for me I sort of look at it it's a really changing industry you look at SMAs now SMAs from an investment perspective we don't really need to be managing people's money the way you probably used to if you wanted to build your own model portfolios Mm. so it's like well what else am I offering what, what are my clients coming to me for? And for me, a financial planner is really that person that helps guide clients to be able to make sound financial decisions. If they want to change jobs, if they want to have a family, you know, it's on such another level. It's not about, you know, whether or not you can make them, I don't know, 1% more in their investments than they got last year. Yeah, totally. Totally, totally. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm on board. <laughs> That's why I'm here learning more. Um, so, after you finished the 10 week course, have you had to implement different technology? Has there been a huge investment in change of processes? How has this been um, operationally implemented into your world? Uh, yeah, so it's look not hugely like it's not a big impact. Um, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you think of X plan, like if you're trying to implement X plan in your business, like that takes forever. And I'm still learning and you know developing X plan. But money coaching really, it's it's just finding how it really slots in to your business. So when a client comes to me, I talk through, okay, this is my process. I'm a money coach, but I'm also a lifestyle financial planner. Mm-hmm. And the money coaching, this is what it'll help you achieve. Mm -hmm. as opposed to the financial planning. So I do give clients the choice as to what they want to do. Um, They can, uh, Most clients do both. Um, However, some clients just say, I just want to do the financial planning. And I'm like, that's fine and I'll do that. But, yeah, it's more just having the, I guess, your own little personal system worked out and, you know, it's just booking meetings in and, there's a bit of homework in between, so you do have to do some external work outside of those meetings. So it's just making sure that you've got the time to be able to do that as well. 
And do they have to practically complete question? Like I'm just thinking from a tech stack perspective, did you leave this coaching course and they were like, right, you need to use this tech, you need to use these questionnaires, you need to embed. Like how does that work for you? Yeah, so there's no specific tech as such, but there is documents. So I'll email a client like a money biography, money history document for them to complete. And it's pretty much Word and Excel everything. Could that change? I think, yes, it could. Like I'm sure there's ways we could adapt that to be better for a client experience. But these are, I guess, through the training, I'm just using the documents that um, we were giving and, given and the tools that we were given. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to understand. The reason I ask is, you know, it's always interesting to understand I love all of this stuff. I love it. But then I give it to Paul Glenn and he's like, how does this actually practically get implemented? Do we have to have 75 new systems to do this? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> no real system as such. I mean, you might want to, you know, I guess put the emails into a CRM system that pop out when mm. after a client does an appointment, that sort of thing you could do. <clears throat> I'm sure there's certainly ways you could build it in better than I have. I mean, <laughs> it's a learning process really I think it is a journey it is a hundred percent a journey and I guess why I asked that was because if it did require a big tech stack and it did require a whole new, you know complicated implementation I think it would put advisors off but hearing that it's using all of the things that we use all day long anyway it really takes away the barrier of why you wouldn't stop mm. so what was your biggest learning what what was the thing that you were just like oh my gosh this is really awesome for me to take back into my new business world. Um, do you know what I love is the aha moments that clients get, those breakthroughs. Yeah. That's the biggest thing for me. Like, you know, you'll go through this process with a client and then it's like those light bulb moments that mm. you're talking about and it's like, wow, okay, you, those breakthroughs and that's the thrill. Like I – you know, don't get me wrong, I, I really enjoy planning, um, but I love the money coaching. So when you think about passion, that's yeah. definitely where my passion lies. And do you feel that the course gave you the framework or even just the confidence of knowing how to navigate those conversations better than before? Yeah, definitely. And I one thing I forgot to mention is I actually went through the money coaching process myself. I was wondering whether you had like this, but I was like, I'm not going to ask because it might be a bit personal and I like going, very <laughs> personal. It would be, I mean, I think we should all do it as a, as financial advisors. We no doubt have all of this that in front of with us as well. Oh, my God. Like, the, like I can tell you every session I had, I was in tears. Like the stuff that came up and, you know, when you're going back into your childhood, how you grew up, mine was a big sense of responsibility being the eldest of for siblings and family business and all these things and you know as I said my father passing away like so much of these stuff you hold on to and it really shapes you especially shapes you how your relationship with money is and you know you want to have a good relationship with money but when you dig deep often people don't necessarily have a great relationship there's a really good question that Deborah talks about if money was your lover how would you describe your relationship with it Fascinating. Mm, do you want to ask? <laughs> um, uh, I definitely can. Um, I read Money and Love Story. I think it's like Katie North, I think is her name, um, about eight or nine years ago. I was still a BDF. I read it on a weekend away with some girlfriends um, up on the Central Coast of New South Wales, and I feel awful because they didn't really see me <laughs> for the whole weekend because I – basically sat with this book that gets you to do all these questions and I realized that I didn't have a very good relationship with money. I had quite a scarcity mindset with money. I came from a family where money didn't grow on trees, as my stepfather used to tell me over and over again. And so I definitely had a lot of scarcity built into how I thought about money. So I don't know how I would translate that to a lover. Um, But I actually sat and did a workbook myself to try to understand my behaviors and um, why I was like happy to pay for things for other people as a gift, but not for myself. And that there was a lot of things that were showing up that were really confronting, really confronting. And even now, I'll do a small confession because it is a journey. Even now, I still have to remind myself of why 
I need to do. So I have gum boots that have been broken for about a year. Catherine, gum boots that are broken are effectively redundant in terms of the purpose that they're there for. And I found these gum boots that are quite good, but they're so expensive. And I, and I literally have to pitch to myself why it's okay to spend the money on something. And that's so silly because I am a financial advisor and I have good cash flow and I have good savings and I have investments and I have all the stuff. So I think you can do the work, but then you still need to keep yourself accountable, which probably speaks to the ongoing relationship piece that you were talking about. Because I can imagine you do the four sessions. People have all these beautiful aha moments. But then there's the rust and on habits and the practicalities of actually changing. Yep, yep. That's right. Like you definitely go through – um so when you go through the process, you when you identify some of these key um, behaviours and these key patterns, we pick three of them to start working on. And so okay. then we start, okay, well, what are the tools? What are the things you can start doing to start shifting those patterns and behaviours? And the key thing is, you know, people, as you said, like you hadn't realised, but once you actually started working on it and working on yourself, you're like, wow, okay, this is coming up for me and not even realising why, how, where did this come from. Once you start to understand that, like for myself, I understand like I'm a very um, clear warrior which is great, like a warrior is who you want to be. They're driven, financially successful, wise with money, but I also have the tyrant so I can use um, money as a way of control and in some ways manipulation like it, it's my you know so when that comes in it's like hang on why is that coming in what's going on in my life that's bringing that in what's my triggers that are happening so you get like an archetype I, I worried for I wondered for a second there were you saying a warrior or a warrior a warrior, warrior. warrior. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually get sort of an archetype that has all these behavioral patterns that you might behave in when you're in your normal state and when you're in your sort of threat or stress state is that sort of what happens yeah. yeah do you want me to tell you what the um archetypes are yeah yeah okay so we've got the innocent and the innocent is how often have you heard the term ostrich head in the sand mm. very much the innocent and a lot of women are innocents mm. um, more so than men so mm. definitely you know i don't want to deal with it if i don't deal with it i don't have to think about it yeah. then got the victim and the victims are the hardest ones to actually shift from a behavioral side they're often living in the past and they're often blaming others for what's happened in their life and mm -hmm. it's interesting when this comes up i've got a few clients where this has played out and they, they can be hard from a financial planning aspect because you can do a plan for them but when they're blaming everyone else They'll, they'll often leave you or they'll blame you for what's going on or why they haven't got to where they wanted to get to. Um, the warrior, as I said, really focused on, you know, their goals, being really driven, really um, focused as well. The martyr, um, a lot of women can relate to this, the caretaker, but the over-caretaker, the over-giver. Um, they generally put everyone ahead of themselves as well. The fool, now the fool is, uh, you want a bit of fool in you because the fool, you know, I think probably you and I have a bit of fool in us, Jess, because taking that leap to start your own business. So it's a, yep, a little bit of a gamble, but mm. you need your warrior there because the warrior actually helps you focus and, you know, be goal-oriented, but you need that fool to actually help you take that leap. Wow. But if you're yeah. too much full, then you don't actually worry about money. They're often big spenders. They'll give their last shirt off their back to someone else. They don't even think about it. Um, the creator artist, and the creator artist is someone that's very non-materialistic. So a lot of art, arty people, definitely no. creator artists. Um, you know, they don't want to deal with money. Um, they don't like it as mm. well. And this can be hard. I don't know if you've ever seen but people that are in jobs that don't ask for pay rises or if they're self-employed not knowing how to ask for money as mm. well. Um, that's that's definitely the fool. The tyrant, as I said, um, using a control or, or feeling that that's their only way or that's something that they can control as well. And often um, the tyrant, they'll never have enough. I've got a client that's a tyrant and earns a bucket load of money but it's never enough. So in their mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one's a magician. And the magician is 
the person that transforms reality. So we want to have a high magician. It's that person that's financially balanced. They're often spiritual um, or have some sort of faith, but the magician is our key. So we basically effectively want our warrior in our front seat driving our vehicle. We then want our um, magician next to us navigating where we go because we can go off track and that's okay but they get us back to where we're going and we want our creator artist in the back seat because they hold our vision so where are we going what are we driving towards but don't forget where we're going and why i love i think i just need to go into this course because i am sitting here thinking oh i know that that is this and this person in my client base oh that's this this and this person and that's this you know i can I don't know enough yet to know whether they really are, but um, I think anyone that would be listening would be able to deeply resonate with some of these archetypes and, and recognise that they also have clients that fit them. And I guess something that you said is really important to, I guess, remind people of, that this isn't an income play because often it's like, well, you know, my clients earn really good income. They have to, you know, to be able to work with me, they need to have X amount of income, X amount of investable assets. It's like, yeah, but they're self-sabotaging because of their behaviours. It actually doesn't matter how much they earn. If you're a tyrant where it's never enough and you're constantly needing more, like we could be better planners or financial advisors knowing and being equipped with this stuff so that we can actually help them help themselves, which is frankly why we're here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's... um. And that's why I got into it because I'm like, you can help people on another level. And going through it myself was definitely a big breakthrough as well. Uh, you know, what you find out about yourself as you've, you know, gone through a similar type process. So being able to take that through, take clients through that journey, it's, um, yeah, it's amazing. If they do money coaching with you first and then do the financial planning piece, does any of the money coaching pieces come into the statement of advice or a record of advice or do they completely segregate each other? No, because you with money coaching you're not talking about money per se. Yeah. So money's just a tool. Like it's just something we use in our life, but money is often the symptom for many of our underlying issues. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, how is that dictating our life? How is it defining our life? So it's um it's not an SOA and this is a hard thing to get to over to compliance. It's like, look, I'm not talking about budgeting, I'm not talking about money in that sense. Mm. So it is purely behavioural. And did that take some convincing? What was that like for us not to AF as long saying, please let me do this and charge for it and not give a strategy document? Yeah, yeah, it was just trying to explain. It's like, look, this is what it's about, you know, with it's not strategy, it's not product. Um, it's purely the behaviour of a client and helping them uncover and identify what their money archetypes are and okay, which are the challenging characteristics that we need to really start shifting. And presumably, given that you do it, they came around and they are okay with you doing that now. Yeah, yeah. And I think because it's more, there's more people out there doing it now. Interesting. Uh, so just a quick one on how you're implementing this post the four sessions. And I know that I should pull out, like, this is something that you've done relatively recently. So you're probably still learning and iterating it. But in your mind's eye, how will this work for people who've done the four sessions with you, come out far more knowledgeable, far more understanding of themselves and probably their significant other? Will they have regular check-ins? Will they um, do reviews? How will you charge for that? What does that look like? Yeah, so it is definitely a work in progress. So the four-step call process is very you know, very structured, as I said, diagnostically driven process that we do. What comes after that is what we call beyond the core process. And that's just charging an hourly fee to go through a session with a client. Mm -hmm. And there's more tools that you can use through those sessions. Um, Some of those tools I actually use from a financial planning aspect. Like when I'm If a client then starts financial planning, I will sometimes give them a couple of those tools just to use because then it gives me a better understanding of where they see themselves is what we call a visionary visioning exercise. And that really helps me understand, okay, where do they see themselves in the future? What do they really want? What's really important to them? Mm, Great. I mean, we do a similar session called the Goals and Values session. We didn't have any framework. We made it up through lots of research, but it sounds like that a templated thing that you can literally plug and play if you're not currently having those conversations. Yeah, very easy. 
random question. Um, when you were doing your research around money coaching, because I haven't looked into this at all, it's been on my to-do list, which is quite long. Um, are there lots of providers that do this? Is this like the main one? How did you pick what course you did? Um, I actually don't know any other courses out there to do this sort of work. So Deborah's actually like the founder. She's done a lot of research around money coaching over many years. So she's developed this herself um, and built this basically academy or training place um, in in California. So, yeah, I don't know any others that you could go to um, for this, but I do know that they had launched recently one specifically for financial planners, a, a more shorter course type program as well that they launched a while ago. I don't know if they're continuing to do that, but I know Karen, who I was speaking about earlier, herself and Deborah were running that. It was yeah. advertised on LinkedIn as well. So, yeah, but I'm yeah. not sure. I mean, you're not sponsored by them, but what is the course no. name again, just in case anyone is interested in doing it? Uh, it's just the Certified Money Coaching course through the Money Coaching Institute. I think Leah Shodell did this years ago. And she I, did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's the same people. Yeah. Anything that I haven't asked you about the Money Coaching course that you think is important for financial advisors or anyone in our world to know about? I think we've probably touched on everything from a coaching perspective. I mean, yeah. it sounds amazing. It sounds like a toolkit that we haven't had before. It sounds like it's leading to more revenue opportunities for your business, more uh, uh, moments for your clients, uh, better coaching conversations in the future around why they may not be sticking to their plan and helping them remember who they came out as and how that might be showing up. Like, I really can see that this, as we move into more coaching-based strategic financial advice. Like, I can't see that this isn't going to be the future in how we work. I guess it's just learning process and the tools and then adapting our businesses accordingly. I'm not yeah, Definitely. Probably the only thing I will say is, you know, when a client comes on board, you tend to want to do the financial planning and get into it and, okay, let's get the SOA done, let's get the plan done. You know, you have to take that step back if you're doing money coaching first because mm-hmm. it's like, okay, this is going to take probably a couple of months to go mm-hmm. through that first and right. then moving into the financial planning. So that's probably the one thing um, just to be aware of, like to be patient yeah. around what um, – you know, around having that process implemented in your business. And the other thing as well, there is, so the money coaching um, course is specifically more for individuals. I know from a planning aspect, we do look at couples and I did the couples training as well. So that is a little bit different. Um, There is crossover, but it's very different, um, you know, some different tools that we use around the communication barriers in um, clients' relationships and, as I said, the conflict in money. So that was definitely worthwhile for me to do um, as well. Fascinating. And I must immediately run off and go and sign up to do the course, I think. Um, This has been so interesting and so helpful because I wanted someone who's actually done it, who lives in our world, who isn't, you know, sponsored or working there to tell us what it's been like and how it's changed your business, which sounds like it's multifaceted and I wish you all the very best for continued implementation. Thanks, Jess. Can we finish with some rapid-fire questions? Yes, go for it. I make them sound meaner than they are. You can take your time in replying. I just I want to make sure that as we're on our quest to have our clients or members live better lives, we do so ourselves because there is that beautiful irony that exists often. So I'd love to know what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health? One thing. Yeah. <laughs> God, I do multiple things. <laughs> what do you do to look after your mental health? Um, I see a kinesiologist regularly. Ooh, She's great. amazing. And she helped me actually to take the step into starting my own business. Okay. And, um, yeah, reading, walking, yoga. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, a piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Oh, God. I think just being yourself. Don't be scared because you are good enough. Amen. Uh, what is one big thing that's on your bucket list that you haven't done yet? Uh, 
definitely from a travel perspective, going to Canada and spending some time doing the Rockies. Oh, that would be so good. That would be so, so good. Uh, last rapid fire question. I have a fake book club, which is just that people tell me to read books and I read them. Do you have a book that I could put on my fake book club hit list and why should I read? <laughs> I'm actually reading, um, can I swear on this? I think so. I do. Um, Rich as Fuck at the moment. Oh. Have you heard of it? Amanda no, Francis? But I'm like immediately adding to read this. Tell me, what is it? Tell us what, a little bit more about the book. Have you literally just started? Um, yeah, I'm probably halfway through. She's a life coach about money. So she basically teaches mainly women about um, becoming more empowered around money. Um, you know, in a sense, some of the manifestations we can do around money and believing in ourselves when it comes to what you can do. So very much up my alley when we're talking about emotive behaviours around money. And totally lends itself to the conversation that we've just had. And in case Apple or whoever cut it out, I'll just say it's rich AF. People can yeah. work out what that means. <laughs> you just need to have the G-rated version of that. Um, that sounds amazing. I need to read that. Uh, there are so many posts in so little time. Thank you. That is awesome. I have really enjoyed today's conversation. I don't know whether you came here to pitch to me about why I need to do it, but I am fully pitched. I've drank the Kool-Aid. I need to go and do it immediately. It sounds like it's really created amazing, dynamic conversations for you and your world. So huge congrats for making the leap to becoming an advisor. Again, again, starting your own business and now adding in a whole different skill set. That is awesome and I can't wait to watch your business grow. Thanks, Jess. It's definitely been life-changing. I imagine it has. Thanks, Catherine. Pleasure.